For as long as humankind has dared to dream of escaping the confines of their environment, whether it be travelling to a distant land, escaping the rut of everyday life, or reaching out to the stars, there has been an insatiable appetite to fulfil our fantasies. Even the earliest experiments in immersive experiences showed much promise. The Sensorama was perhaps one of the very first of these devices. Built as a prototype in 1962 by Morton Heilig, the Sensorama had a 3D stereoscopic display, stereo sound, and the ability to produce aromas and wind effects. Considered largely a novelty at the time, the Sensorama had little exposure to the wider world. While not truly a virtual world, the Sensorama had many of the tenets and features that many latter-day VR devices would deem important. Designed by Ivan Sutherland and Bob Sproul, named for its imposing size, the Sword of Damocles featured simple wireframe models but allowed for head and eye tracking. The Sword of Damocles was also not fully immersive, with the user being able to see through certain parts of the HMD. While not specifically designed for a commercial release, the Sword of Damocles embodied many of the problems with early VR systems. It was costly, far too large to be realistically marketed to the consumer, and was not fully immersive. In the subsequent years, and with the advent of video game technologies and faster and more powerful CPUs, VR once again saw a revival. Many video game companies decided to try their hand at creating their own VR experiences. Some designed for arcades, and a smaller group designed for home markets. One of the most notorious and ill-fated examples of the time was Nintendo's Virtual Boy. Released in North America and Japan in 1995, the Virtual Boy was somewhat unique in that it acted as a console rather than a peripheral. As a result, the system was priced at around $180. This price was a lot to ask for a relatively unknown technology at the time. Price and lack of software support eventually signalled a death knell for the Virtual Boy. The failure of the Virtual Boy sent a message to major hardware developers of the time. VR was a dead end. This setback did not deter some developers from chasing the dream of immersive VR. From the mid-90s to the late 2000s, many smaller companies tried their hand at creating their own VR head-mounted displays. Many of these devices suffered from similar problems. These included, but were not limited to, motion sickness, latency problems, small field of view, cost, and size. This is where Palmer Lucky becomes important. From an early age, Lucky had a keen interest in technology especially when it came to taking it apart and rebuilding it. By using his technological expertise, Lucky spent time repairing and selling iPhones, accruing himself a small fortune in the process. The money from this venture ultimately funded his interest into VR, amassing possibly one of the largest collections of VR HMDs in the world. Lucky gained a unique insight into where VR had gone wrong and right in the past. Taking his knowledge of technology and the love of VR, Lucky set out to create his own VR system that solved all of the problems of the past and answered the questions of the future. Prototypes were a mixture of reverse engineered devices and others built from the ground up using individual components. Time spent on internet forums discussing his latest prototypes eventually led to a chance encounter with John Carmack. Carmack was renowned as the co-founder of id Software as well as the lead programmer for multiple video games including Doom, Wolfenstein 3D and Quake. Lucky and Carmack started discussing their own insights and experiences with VR, with Carmack seemingly working on his own ideas at the time. In an interview with Eurogamer, Lucky said, where well, he ended up seeing my head-mounted display work and asked me, hey, what you have looks interesting, is there any chance I could buy one? He's John Carmack, Lucky snorts. I just gave him one instead, you can't turn him down. This was to be a turning point in the development of what would later be known as the Oculus Rift. Later that year, Carmack decided to show one of Lucky's prototypes at E3, the biggest video game showcase in the world. This act of public support was to further help ramp up publicity for the device. In Carmack's own words, when we look at that now, it was clearly the inflection point. Emboldened by feedback from E3, Lucky decided to leave college and form Oculus VR in June of 2012. This was to kickstart the next stage of development. August 12th of 2012 was to be a defining year in the history of VR. This was the official date that the Kickstarter page for the Oculus Rift developer kit was created. Kickstarter allowed backers to pledge money to support the project, or to receive developer kits for themselves. These developer kits contained the prototype headset, which at the time featured a resolution of 1280 by 800 pixels, an LCD screen, and no positional tracking. This iteration of the Oculus Rift was light years ahead of any previous VR HMDs. The low resolution screen resulted in users seeing the screen door effect. This is where the black lines between pixels become visible, as if the user was looking at the image through a screen door. 
The head tracking was praised. It was noted, however, that while the Oculus could detect how your head was angled, it could not detect where your head was. This was problematic. Users would often try to lean in on virtual objects, as they would in real life, only to be disappointed when the display would not mirror this action, shattering the immersion. The Oculus Rift also required an external control box. While not reducing the overall experience, it made the device less compact. These issues, and many other smaller issues, combined to make the first iteration of the Oculus Rift slightly nauseous. However, the Oculus Rift was still highly commended for solving many of the problems that VR had in the past. Much of the praise that the Oculus Rift received at the time of the Kickstarter, and previously, was from video game industry acolytes, such as Gabe Newell of Valve, Cliff Blazinski of Epic Games, and David Helgeson of Unity. The feedback the Oculus Rift received, as well as the support from the video game industry, ensured that it reached its goal of $250,000 within a day, and received a total of nearly $2.5 million by the end of their Kickstarter project. The total funds acquired by the Kickstarter was beyond what Palmer Lucky had anticipated, with his original goal being to pay for the costs of parts, manufacturing, shipping, and credit card slash Kickstarter fees, with about $10 left over for a celebratory pizza and beer. The extra money, and support from Carmack and others, allowed Oculus VR to hire more staff, and focus on solving the problems of the first iteration of the Oculus Rift. Eventually, by March 2014, the second iteration of the Oculus Rift, known as Development Kit 2, was announced. Between the first and second iterations, Oculus VR had transformed from being a one-man operation to employing around 100 staff. Many of the current staff hail from large technology companies and video game developers, such as Apple, Valve, Microsoft, IBM, and many others. This wealth of knowledge was further enabled by a $75 million investment from various sources. This allowed the development kit too to refine and improve many of the features that the Oculus Rift was known for. The screen resolution of the original development kit was improved from 640x800 to 960x1080 in each eye. This helped to drastically reduce the screen door effect, but it was still noticeable to a degree. Displays were changed from LCD to AMO LED, improving overall picture quality and contrast. The change to AMO LED also allowed for a higher refresh rate, reducing motion blur, one of the bigger problems with the first iteration. The external control box was done away with, making the overall device more compact. This was a small milestone to making the Oculus a more mobile experience. One of the most important additions was the inclusion of a small external camera. This allowed the device to track your head in a space, which made actions such as leaning or crouching have a corresponding effect within the device. All these improvements helped to create a much more immersive experience, but the Oculus Rift was far from ready for a consumer release. On March 25, 2014, it was announced that Oculus VR had been acquired by Facebook for $400 million, $1.6 billion in Facebook stock, as well as an additional $300 million, provided that Oculus VR met certain financial obligations. While the extra money had secured Oculus VR's future to a certain degree, the inclusion of Facebook to what many had seen as a relatively untouched technology company was not unanimously praised. Many high-profile technology and video game personalities derided the decision for Facebook to become involved, with Minecraft creator Marcus Notch Pearson publicly declaring, we were in talks about maybe bringing a version of Minecraft to Oculus. I just cancelled that deal. Facebook creeps me out. Pearson later retracted his statement, but many others still had concerns about Facebook being involved. To this end, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook's CEO, addressed potential concerns. Oculus already has big plans here that won't be changing and we hope to accelerate. Zuckerberg also pledged that Oculus VR would remain an independent entity within Facebook, much like Instagram. Subsequent to Oculus VR's acquisition, the Oculus team debuted an updated version of the Oculus in September 2014 known only as Crescent Bay. This iteration featured 360 degree tracking, improved weight, and built-in audio. The Crescent Bay prototype was just another addition to the ranks of prototypes developed by Oculus VR. Samsung and Oculus VR also released the Gear VR, a partnership product that has many of the innovations of the Oculus Rift, while utilizing a Samsung Galaxy Note 4. The Gear VR was a device that was meant to be much more portable, while also at a lower price range, as opposed to the raw power of the Oculus Rift. While less of an Oculus VR device than a Samsung one, the Gear VR shows the willingness of Oculus VR to partner with other large technology companies. This may prove a useful insight into how Oculus VR may develop the Oculus Rift technology and brand over the coming years. In 2015, Oculus VR announced that the Rift would most likely ship in 2016. This turned out to be true. The consumer version of the Rift was finally announced and advanced pre-orders could be placed, starting at $599. 
It is expected that the Rift will be in the hands of the consumer by July 2016, with a whole new set of upgrades and extras. This includes improved resolution and 360 degree tracking. The consumer version bundles with an Xbox One controller and two games, Eve Valkyrie and Lucky's Tale. Further down the line, the Oculus Touch controllers will be released, with hand tracking at the heart of this device. This will allow the user to feel more immersed in the VR space. It is yet to be seen whether or not the Oculus Rift will be as successful as the developers hope it will be, but perhaps in a few years time we will look back and say, the VR revolution started here. Think VR is a fad? Want to see more features added to the Oculus Rift? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe and share. I'm Fractional Bruce, thanks for watching.